Okay, it's to time to start the session. Uh, how to love developers like your customers, Ishan Khanna. Let's do it. Thank you. Uh, so uh, my name is Ishan Khanna. It's early. But um, I work uh, as an Android engineer at uh, Booking.com uh, in Amsterdam, Netherlands. And today I'm going to talk on the topic called how to love your developers like your customers. Uh, it's nothing fancy, but we always, almost always, neglect our uh, coworkers. We always focus about uh, the customer because we think they're the ones paying us money. But our co-developers, de uh, co designers, product owners, and everybody else make significant contribution. And we should make their lives easier, uh, just like we do for our customers, whichever product you offer. Uh, here's the outline <clears throat> of uh, the talk today. Uh, I'd like to share, in the beginning, a brief inspiration uh, for the talk about where the idea came from. Uh, then we'll look into some debug features. What are they? Who are they for? How do you think about building them? <clears throat> then uh, some common scenarios, uh, which almost all the developers must have faced in their lives, or if, they're, if you're beginning to write Android apps, you might face. Uh, then we'll also see how we can leverage uh, the open source uh, tooling uh, for all this stuff. And at the end, I'd like to uh, show you a cool debugging trick. So if you're planning to leave, please come back before I end the talk. Uh, inspiration uh, for the talk. Uh, it is important, like, we have a lot of Android developers at Booking.com. Uh, if I give you a number, let's say 60 plus. Uh, and we all work on uh, one app, majority of us. And we're spread across multiple teams, so we own multiple uh, screens. And because of this, uh, it is important for us to have some common tooling that allows us to test the common scenarios uh, for the app whenever we write new features. And this way, we can reduce some mundane work uh, that goes into testing stuff over and over again. Uh, Debug features, what are they? So anything that requires you to iterate over builds uh, can be regarded as uh, debugging. And features that prevent you from triggering those builds over and over again are called debug features. Who are they for? Well, developers, Android, iOS, anybody who is able to test your app, your QAs, uh, product owners, product managers, of course, designers. Uh, not to forget copywriters. So let's look at a scenario uh, which is the most common one that a lot of uh, you who've written Android apps before and they've done some sort of network communication uh, would have faced. So it's about the server URLs. So let's say you have an Android app and you have uh, developers who have their own instances on which they are developing the APIs, uh, giving you new endpoints or making additions to the previous ones. You want to test a new API from some other developer's instance, but the current build of the app has some other instance. And the code, uh, like this scenario looks like this. The code inside looks something like this. Uh, you have a retrofit instance. Well, nowadays you just use OKHttp OK and give that to retrofit, but it's from the uh, website. And the base here is something that you might, you might want to change. And it happens very often like, Somebody would come up to you, hey, can you just change and create a new flavor of the build? I want to test this on this instance. What you do is you just go change the URL to point to the dev3 and hit the play button, and then the madness begins. Gradle build running. Well, what if you had an interface that allowed the person who wanted to make a change to just do whatever, to just write whatever URL they want to test in? Click on change, and bam, the app restarts. Everything comes from the new server. That's scenario one. Another one, the copies. So if you're writing apps that are being used in different countries, uh, you are localizing them. I hope you are. If you're not, please do that. Uh, Booking.com supports 43 languages in their app. And you can book your hotel. In, in almost 43 languages, which is a lot. 
And for us, as a developer, I mean, we know Java. Now we are learning Kotlin. Those 43 languages are still way uh, into the future that we might want to learn. So what happens then is when you create a new feature, you want to make sure that it works seamlessly across all the languages. And you don't break the UI at any point of time. It's something not very intuitive to understand, but I'll show you a small example through which we'll try to understand what might go wrong in, in this case. So this is a page where you see some search results on the, on the booking.com app. When you make a search in a city, uh, you see a recycler which has some list items. So right now the app is in English. And I changed the language to Japanese. I don't understand almost like most of the stuff here, but still, if you see them side by side, you can clearly see that there is a difference in, in a lot of text views. So some are going uh, much uh, wider. And in the first one, you can see in city center goes to the next line, whereas in the English one, it is still in this line. Now, in this one, it is fixed. But it might so happen that in, in some language, the copy is too long. And it just overflows, or it just, get, it just gets cut. And you might never notice because you've always expected this to be in English. Because uh, in different languages, months have different names, uh, days have different names, and we don't know which one might overflow and which one might not. So it's always a good idea to have some sort of tooling that allows somebody who's well versed with that language to quickly see what new feature you've made in that language. And that you can do by just providing a small uh, UI that allows them to change the language from within the app. So you don't have to go to the OS level, change the language, and then worry about how am I going to get back in that language or something. So if you do this from here, almost anybody can test new copies uh, instantly. And there's the third scenario. So of course, we're in Japan. You have great internet. I work from Amsterdam. We have great internet. But not all the world has great internet. If you talk about India, where I think we're going to get the next billion people online, uh, we still don't have very nice internet connectivity in majority of the country. So how do you test stuff for them? You could have a network throttling mechanism, which allows you to test, like, instantly slow down the network requests. And it's, it's very simple, just one Java class. And we leverage the interceptors of OKSTTP. I'm hoping everybody is well versed with what OKCTP is. So all you have to do is just implement this uh, interceptor. Uh, it will have a minimum request delay and a max delay, which can be altered from anywhere that you like, like a debug screen or whatever. It's uh, a static instance here. And then there's a simple logic to just randomly check if if the current value is uh, slower, you delay the request. You just pause it. If not, you let it through. And with this, you can create multiple uh, types of interceptors. Like you have really nice connectivity. You have flaky connection. You have very slow connection. Or you want to fail all the requests without actually killing your uh, network on the phone. You can do this with this interceptor. And then you have this static method, which can toggle stuff from outside. Of your, uh, of your interceptor. And then all you need to do is just add this interceptor in your OKS TDP builder, and you're ready to go. Another common scenario that we face at Booking is the unavailability of play services in a lot of devices and countries. And people completely overlook that. Have a look at this. So this is a screen which shows where this hotel is on the map. Now, this is a Google map. And we assume we have Google Play services, so we do this. But what happens where you don't have Google Play services? You just don't want to have a blank screen. You don't want the user to suffer. You can use OpenStreetMaps. But then for that, you need something that allows you to test it. So you should have some way to reproduce this scenario without having to rebuild the app over and over again. Scenario five is notifications. You should allow people to throw notifications without going through the whole user flow. So let's say you wanted to have a notification which says the booking is confirmed. 
Now, I don't want to make a search, go through the search results, click on a hotel, then select room, fill in my info, and then wait for the confirmation to come. I should have a mechanism to just hit a button and see the notification, because I just want to see the design, how the notification looks, uh, what are the, the CTAs there, uh, how can we tweak stuff there. You don't really need to go through the whole scenario, and it will save you and anybody who's testing this a lot of time. So applying app-wide changes, now we know what we want to do, but then one thing is like, OK, I throttled the network to, let's say, slow down the requests. Now how do I make sure that the next requests are slowing down? Because you might have initialized everything way earlier. This is where a library called Process Phoenix, developed by Jake Wharton, uh, comes into play. And what it can do is it can allow you to start a default activity in the whole new process. So you don't have to hit the back button or uh, put the app in the background, clear it, and then run it again. You just use this, it'll rebirth uh, the activity. Or if you want to launch it with an intent to go to some other place uh, or pass in some info when it's restarting, you can do that. And then if you want to check if you're already in the process, here's what you can do and just return. Don't reinvent the wheel. Now, why I say that is because most of the common scenarios that I talked about here, some other person would have faced and might already have a solution. Try to reuse that. Try to Google that before writing it on your own. And that's where open source comes into play. So leveraging existing open source solutions is the key here. And now we're going to see some really, really nice and important libraries that you all should have in your projects. Uh, the first one is Stetho. It's a really powerful tool developed by Facebook, completely open source. Uh, and this will allow you to do a lot of stuff uh, that you might otherwise struggle doing with, the, with all uh, the tool set which is already provided by Google. So all you need to do is just integrate Stetho in your app. You see the Chrome DevTools, just go to Inspect, click on the Inspect, and it will open uh, your Chrome DevTools with a lot of tabs. Each tab has a different function, which we'll go through now. The first one that you can see here is, is uh, the network one, which we're going to talk about. It will allow you to monitor all your network requests. You can preview your images that you're downloading, how long are they taking. If they have JSON payloads, you can see them right there. Uh, you can see all the headers and stuff. And you can even export this in the HAR format with this. The next is the Resources tab, which is also really nice. If you have SQLite databases or if you're using shared preferences and you want to see what it is, instead of typing out the code in your Android app, you can just do this from here. And this allows you uh, to completely read and write your SQLite values, uh, which is uh, a bonus. Then it also allows you to do some uh, view hierarchy inspection. Uh, which only works uh, on the ice cream sandwich and above APIs. And you can click and highlight the views on the phone from this tab itself. Uh, pretty neat. Then it also connects the JavaScript console, which can execute code on your Android side. So if you see the example here, uh, what they've tried to do is they've tried to print the name of a resource string called app underscore name right from the, the JavaScript console, uh, which is pretty awesome. It, it, again, the, uh, you don't have to compile the app again. You don't have to go through the Gradle madness over and over. You can just do everything from here. It installs in one line of code. All you have to do is just integrate the, the Stetho library. Just take it, put it in your build.gradle, add this line, and it integrates almost everything apart from the network interceptors, uh, for which you need another line of code, which is available in the documentation. And then you also have all the network monitoring through Stetho. The next one is Leak Canary. It is developed by Square and is also open source. Pretty nice library for uh, like seeing memory hogs or memory leaks. But the thing is, People often integrate it and then just forget about it. And then it, it keeps complaining. We just keep swiping the notification. So it is important if you install this in your app, in your app code, 
please make sure that you pay attention to what it is saying. Try to find out the reasons why it is complaining, because certainly uh, something would be going wrong. And then there are also false po positives, which can be suppressed. But this is a really nice library. Then there's Timber. Uh, it is also by Jake Wharton. God, that guy writes too much code. <laughs> uh, and it allows you to do your logging pretty neatly. And it prevents you from leaking your logging code in the production app. And you can just toggle your logs on and off by uh, one place. So uh, making the most out of the Android Studio debugger. This is the portion that I wanted to talk about in the end. Uh, imagine you have a code which does some on point view uh, holding there. And it's a pretty simple list item which has a header text and a footer text. And you want to change uh, the color of every third item uh, to green. So this is something that you would typically do if position mod this equals uh, 0, and then you would set the color. You hit the button, and then the madness begins again. Now, there is a way you could test out this thing without building your app again. You can bypass Gradle completely. How? Here's what you have to do. So you go to create a new run config. Uh, you hit on run, edit configs. And then uh, from the left, you choose the Android app. Now, I like to name it run only, uh, which you'll understand why I say that later. And then uh, you choose the module which you have to uh, build against or you're testing your app against. And then the important part is to see uh, in the installation options, you choose to deploy nothing. You don't have to deploy anything. Because if you deploy, then the Gradle build kicks in. If you don't deploy anything, the Gradle build will never run. And also, uh, you need to clear out the Gradle tasks in the bottom. You don't see them here. But uh, you see two tasks that you need to uh, like clear off. And then you have to choose yeah, like launch default activity or whatever. You can pass intents there. Now what you do is you go to your code. Where do you want it to make the change? Just add a breakpoint. Right click on that breakpoint, and this menu would come up when you uncheck uh, suspend. So you don't have to suspend the app on this breakpoint. Because, of course, if you're testing a recycler view and you want to, if you keep suspending the app on each inflation, it's, it's uh, perfectly silly. What you now do is you enable it, and then you have to go to this evaluate and log. Check this thing. Now add your code here, what you were trying to do in the code and build the app. Add your code here. What this does is, as soon as Android Studio debugger hits the breakpoint, it will not stop, but it will try to evaluate this expression. And once it does that, it actually happens on your phone. It will execute this code. And without building or compiling your code, you actually tested a change there. And now. All you have to do is choose this run config, and you hit the start with debug. And now if you notice there, the Gradle build will not kick in. What will happen is it will just launch the activity with the debugger attached. And once it hits that code, it will be evaluated. You'll see green values on every third item. You're ready to test the chain. Now change green to red to blue to cyan, whatever. And you don't have to build the app again. And Trust me, building the app is a big thing because I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say how long it takes for the booking app to build. It takes a long, long, long time. And I'm pretty sure the legacy projects or, or projects that have been around for a, a long time, everybody has this concern with the build times. And this is a pretty neat trick if you're trying to do something with the views that you can use and then uh, share it with your developers, help them save time. In the end, I like to say, go spread some love. Damn, it should be green. I don't know why I changed the color. Uh, it's done. Uh, questions? Yes? Uh, not so much of a question, but just a remark. Mm -hmm. Mm 
Right. Right, but there are scenarios where there would be some code that will get executed before your debugger gets attached. Yeah, like on app, create. app create, yes. So that's the reason. So I wrote an article about this. A lot of people mentioned this thing. I clearly specified there. It perfectly works if you're doing something outside of that code. But it's always safe to do it with this because then you make sure that the debugger is always attached before any code of your app gets executed. Any other questions? Yeah. So this kind of an actual question. So um, you say you have a really big team you work on the booking app. Right. Um, and you just sort of find out the, the way to make that work. Mm -hmm. So we had, we had a monolith uh, code base in the past, but we've moved to certain modules. We've started splitting the app into modules uh, so that it's mostly because of the build times. The build times are, is something that affects us the most. And we've started uh, moving into modules so that people don't need to build the whole app to test changes in just uh, a small area which they're working in. But we still have uh, a lot of uh, code within one module. Mm -hmm. I, I developed libraries, and um, you might have found out that there's a neat loving solution mm -hmm. for application. Yes. But it's not really the libraries when two libraries uh, are submitted by the same app and register their own to the uh, Right, but then for that. You have, like, you have double logging for yes. the two modules, and suddenly, and the more libraries you have, the more logging you get for each year. Correct. No, so we use, Tim, we use a wrapper on top of Timber. <laughs> yeah, because somebody had added Timber in the code base like pretty early on. And then uh, people started using it. And when it's like 60 developers, uh, it's hard to keep a track of what's happening where. So we just uh, wrote a wrapper on top of that. And now if anybody wants to use the logger, they use our logger internally, it uses Timber. Uh, but what you've pointed out is, is a problem which comes with a very large code base. Uh, early on, I don't think you'd be splitting app uh, into modules very quickly. So that's the thing. OK. Yeah. If there are any other questions, they'll find me. OK. OK, so thank you very much. Thank Please you so much. give him a huge applause.